The goal of the 19th is really to change the conversation around how we talk about women in politics. We are firm believers that all issues are women's issues. Our readers are people who want to be better informed and better able to participate in democracy. We're aiming to change the future of American journalism by giving women the platform and the voice that they deserve. There's never been a better moment than right now. The 19th is the newsroom that we've been waiting for. Hi everyone, what a week we've had so far and we've got so much more to come. Welcome to day four of the 19th Represents, a week of virtual events where we're celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment and examining how far women still have left to go to claim their equal place in our democracy. My name is Emily Ramshaw and I'm the co-founder and CEO of the 19th, a nonprofit newsroom that launched last week at the intersection of gender, politics, and policy. We've heard from a lot of winning women this week, senators, members of Congress, and local leaders who have busted through that glass ceiling. Today, we're going to talk about what it takes for women to win, with women who've won, women who've come close, and women who study the electability myth. We're going to start with a woman who can speak to this better than any other, 2016 Democratic presidential nominee, former Secretary of State and U.S. Senator, and former First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton in conversation with the 19th Washington correspondent, Amanda Becker. Amanda will follow that with a keynote with Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York, who's working to get more conservative women into elective office. Then we'll hear a world-class performance from the New York Philharmonic and three amazing women composers, including one unbelievable kid. We'll round out the day with a conversation on electability and what it takes for women to win with Rutgers political science professor Kelly Dittmar, Hawaii Congresswoman and former presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard, and author Jennifer Palmieri, the former communications director for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Before we begin today's programming, I want to thank the sponsors and philanthropic partners who made this week possible. Goldman Sachs, Intuit, The Impact Seat, The Lenfest Institute, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The Wincote Foundation, The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, the Stardust Fund, Pan America, the Heinz Endowments, CVS Health, the Panacea Collective, Aero PR, and Lingua Franca. I also want to let you know that the 19th is a member-supported newsroom and we can't put on great free programming like this without your support. We hope you'll join us at 19thnews.org. Every $19 helps. If you've missed any of this week's programming or just want to rewatch it, visit 19thnews.org forward slash events. With that, I'm thrilled to introduce Amanda Becker to kick off today's conversation with Secretary Clinton. Welcome to the fourth day of the 19th Represents Summit. We are here today with a woman who really needs no introduction, but I'll give a short one anyway. We are welcoming um, Secretary Hillary Clinton today. She was, of course, a former first lady. Secretary of State and 2016 presidential candidate for the Democratic ticket. Welcome, Secretary Clinton. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm glad to be with you. Thrill thrilled that you're joining us today. Um, we'll get right into it. We have a short amount of time and we got hundreds of questions from you from our viewers and readers. Um, I actually, after covering your campaign in 2016, have been covering the 2020 campaign. I followed a lot of the women who were in that primary. Of course, now we're, you know, we have our de facto nominee and VP, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Many of the candidates told me that they reached out to you, either when they were thinking about running or trying to make that decision or to just get advice as they were starting their campaigns. I was wondering what were some of the most common questions you got from the candidates and what was your advice? Well, Amanda, that's right. Most of the candidates, not all, but most of uh, the original group of nearly 20, uh, reached out to me. I either talked with them on the phone or met with them in person, uh, both the men and the women thinking about running. Um, but it was very uh, clear to me that a lot of the women uh, who were trying to make up their minds about running uh, were interested in talking through, you know, my experiences uh, on the campaign trail uh, what they might expect, uh, how they could deal with it, because although I, I hoped, and I still hope, especially with Kamala on the ticket, uh, that the coverage of women running for president or vice president will be uh, less sexist, uh, less sensationalist, uh, less trivializing, 
um, I told them that they would just have to, you know, be ready for that and be uh, able to ride through it. Uh, so, you know, we also obviously talked about substance um, and the issues they wanted to promote and, and policies that I had championed uh, that uh, they were interested in. Uh, but particularly with the women candidates, it was very much about what the experience of running that gauntlet was like. And I assume you're at home right now in Chappaqua. Is that where you've spent most yes. of the pandemic? Yes. That's where I am. Have been since March. <laughs> <laughs> We're all feeling a little cooped up at this point. Yes, indeed. Are you able but to thank speak again? for Zooming and, and virtual reality because we at least can try to get connected with one another. Exactly. Um, as people start campaigning more, we're seeing more and more House and Senate candidates kind of heading back onto the campaign trail, trying to do socially distant campaign events. I expect that Biden and Harris will start doing the same. What role do you anticipate pay playing in the 2020 elections, whether it's, you know, increasing voting access, campaigning for the presidential ticket or the vice president, um, key Senate races? What role do you see yourself playing over the next few months? Well, I think I've been playing and will continue to play um, two roles. One, on behalf of specific candidates. Obviously, I've done a number of fundraisers for candidates, um, in, including Joe Biden. Uh, I have a lot more on my schedule for the Biden-Harris ticket coming up. Uh, but I've also done fundraisers for uh, candidates uh, running for the House and Senate and even some local uh, officials who uh, I have a relationship uh, with. So I will continue to do whatever I can, both uh, virtually and in person, uh, to support uh, our presidential ticket and in particular candidates for the Senate and the House. But in addition to that, um, I'm very focused on uh, supporting organizations that are fighting hard uh, to try to keep our our voting system intact, uh, try to make sure that people get registered and vote and their votes counted. So the organization that I started after 2016, Onward Together, we support a whole range of groups that are recruiting candidates, training candidates, raising money for candidates, but also doing a lot of cause-related uh, organizing. And we are very focused on vote by mail and all of the uh, hurdles that the Trump administration and their allies are trying to throw in the way of vote by mail during COVID-19, uh, uh, including uh, what I consider a hostile takeover of the post office. So uh, I'm working with lawyers uh, led by Mark Elias at Democracy Docket and others to uh, make that case, work with Stacey uh, Abrams and, and Fair Fight and other groups that are really on the front lines. So I'll be doing uh, both of that uh, between now and November. Uh, President Trump was actually on Fox, I think, earlier this morning talking about the Postal Service and essentially saying that, you know, well, if they don't have to handle all the ballots, then none of this will be an issue what's happening at the Postal Service. For people who aren't tracking it as closely as you are, what is happening at the Postal Service right now? You describe it as a hostile takeover, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, I think starting in the um, early spring, uh, Trump uh, realized uh, that the only way he was going to be able to win uh, is to limit the number of people who vote and the number of votes that are counted. And he took particular aim at vote by mail, which was being ramped up because in the midst of the primary season, uh, with COVID-19 uh, such a threat, a lot of people did not want to get out and go to a polling place. Um, so they wanted to be able to vote by mail, even though they might not totally fit the um, standards for absentee voting in their state. So a lot of states and localities began to uh, change the regulations around vote by mail to make it easier. And a lot of other jurisdictions even began uh, to send out uh, ballots to voters. Uh, in some cases, you know, all the voters uh, that were registered uh, in certain areas. So that made it clear to Trump that he had to uh, even get more aggressive in trying to interfere with vote by mail. I think he's actually wrong about who vote by mail 
would ultimately help, but he's scared of increasing the electorate in any way. So he's got all kinds of shenanigans that he and the Republican National Committee and his allies in governorships and secretaries of state offices are trying to do to uh, mess up the voting. But when it came to the post office, he decided to get even more uh, blatant. And he appo appointed a crony donor um, who I think should not be permitted to serve because he has such a massive conflict of interest since he and his spouse own a lot of stock in competitors to the post office. And he has taken over in a way that has sent chills um, down the spines of a lot of people who understand how the post office should work. Basically, they've been slowing down the mail. Uh, there's a lot, beginning to be a lot of uh, reporting of people not getting their medications, not getting bills that they were supposed to pay uh, so they can't pay them in a timely way. Uh, not getting checks that they are due, like Social Security, because a lot of people still get those in the mail. So they've been slowing down the mail. They've been cutting the hours for uh, people in the post office to process the mail. Uh, and they have increased the cost for what uh, it should cost uh, to send bulk mailings like ballots. And uh, there's just a, a whole range of subversive tactics that they are engaged in. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, just beyond outraging uh, that th this, this administration, this president is not satisfied in destroying a lot of the institutions and undermining the rule of law that they have done. They're going after both the post office and the census. Two American institutions that are actually in the constitution they are trying to undermine uh, to suit their own political and in Trump's case, his personal interests. Thank you for that explanation. Um, I'll go to a couple reader slash viewer questions now. Um, Marsha in Evergreen Park wanted to know, what is the first recommendation you have for Biden about fixing, quote, her words, not mine, the mess Trump has made? Oh my gosh, Marsha, I'll tell you, um, I, I have talked to Vice President Biden, I've talked to uh, Senator Harris, I've talked to people in the campaign, and now people who are working on the transition. Uh, you're right, they are inheriting a mess of historic proportions. Um, and they're going to have to move on many fronts at once. Um, they're going to have to immediately turn their attention to uh, trying to save the economy and help as many people as possible. Uh, Trump seems determined uh, to undermine people's well-being, their jobs, their livelihoods. Uh, they're going to have to continue to work to get uh, the pandemic under control because I don't think it will be over by the time uh, Joe Biden takes office. And one of the biggest challenges will be making sure that the vaccines that come to market are safe and effective something again that Trump seems more interested in following the model of Vladimir Putin, who is declaring you know, vaccines that have not been tested to international standards to be effective and available, and then figure out how to uh, maximize uh, the rollout of vaccinations in our own country and help other countries. Because clearly, you know, if we just vaccinate ourselves, we're not solving the problem. We've got to vaccinate ourselves plus help to vaccinate others. He's going to have to be immediately uh, taking a look at saving and expanding uh, the Affordable Care Act because so many people who lost their jobs, lost their insurance. Well, the list goes on and on. And I, I think that given uh, uh, Vice President Biden's extensive experience in government, I served with him for eight years in the Senate. I saw how he put together coalitions, how he worked to get uh, bills passed. He knows very well that he's going to have to really expect the Congress to do more than one thing uh, at a time, which is a little difficult because it's a cumbersome body. But if we have a Democratic Senate plus a Democratic House under Speaker Pelosi's leadership, I think Joe will be ready to really, you know, flood the gates of all the work that needs to be done as quickly as possible. And frankly, getting rid of all the political appointees in every agency and quickly filling them with honorable Americans who want to serve our country, not just their party um, or their uh, president who demands personal fealty rather than 
loyalty to the oath that people take to protect and defend our country and our constitution. So I think Joe and Kamala together will be uh, absolutely ready for lots of long, long days and, and very short nights working to get as much done as quickly as possible. And that is a great transition to our next question from Barbara in Austin. She wanted to know if you were asked to serve in the next administration, would you accept? Oh, Barbara, I, I would, you know, I'm not even gonna go there because I, I am so focused right now on just helping them get elected, which is what I think everybody should be focused on. And, and let me just add, and I don't want to, I don't want to scare people, but I want you to be prepared. I have every reason to believe that Trump is not going to go, uh, you know, silently into uh, the the night uh, if he loses. He's going to try to confuse us. He's going to try to bring all kinds of lawsuits. He's got his crony uh, attorney general bar ready to do whatever is necessary. So I can't even think yet about the administration. I'm ready to help in any way I can, because I think this will be a moment where every American, I don't care what party you are, I don't care what age, race, you know, gender, I don't care. Every American should want to fix our country. Um, so if you're asked to serve, you should certainly consider that. But let's not get there until we actually win and we protect that win, which is one of the reasons why we need as big a voter turnout as possible, because it limits the chance for Trump to try to undermine the outcome of the election. And look, we know from Trump's own intelligence officials, the Russians are back at it. Uh, we now have other countries who have seen that the Russians were successful in helping to install their favored uh, candidate in 2016. So, you know, they're going to play uh, in our election as well. We have a lot of challenges between now and Election Day. And I would add between Election Day and Inauguration Day uh, to make sure that this election goes really well and the winner is uh, recognized and installed, not just in the popular vote, uh, but also the Electoral College. I'm really glad you brought up the Electoral College because I have some- <laughs> Yes, like my favorite subject, that. Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote in your book after the election that you said, if just 40,000 people across Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania had changed their minds, I would have won. Right. Um, Sarah in the United Kingdom um, wanted to know, why didn't you insist on an audit and recount of those three states? You know, Sarah, it's a really good question. And there, there was, um, at the time, uh, a recount that was undertaken by one of the third party candidates who sadly uh, contributed to my loss. Uh, and it was uh, something that was going to go forward. But it was also clear that certainly in Wisconsin and Michigan at that time, uh, the control over any recount uh, was in the hands of the Republican Party. Uh, so in Wisconsin, uh, the existing governor and all the apparatus uh, was very hostile to any kind of recount and audit. We obviously have evidence uh, independently uh, derived from the Associated Press, from independent investigations that thousands and thousands of voters were unfairly turned away from voting in Milwaukee uh, and elsewhere. And in Michigan, we had a lot of really serious problems that were surfacing like very big undercounts and the like. And so uh, the, the recount effort that was undertaken by the third party, the Green Party, um, tried very hard and we obviously were supportive of that. We wanted to know what the facts were. Um, but were shut off by uh, Republican officials uh, and Republican-led uh, courts. Uh, so it, we don't have a national standard uh, that would overcome uh, local partisanship, and we need one. Now, it's different because both Wisconsin and Michigan um, are under Democratic Party hands, and I think the people running those states now are are very, uh, you know, very fair-minded. Uh, and I, I would have confidence in any uh, recount or audit that they oversaw. Pennsylvania was somewhat different uh, because in that recount effort, 
there was no paper trail at that time of voting in Pennsylvania, if you can believe it. So you had to get into the voting machines themselves. And one of our big problems in this country is that there's a very few number of manufacturers who make these voting machines and they have a lot of political involvement, giving contributions to elected officials and things that I think they should be prohibited from doing, but they will not allow under the contracts they sign to provide the machinery, uh, any searching of the machinery's uh, software uh, because they claim it's intellectual property. So there were a lot of problems that we could not overcome in 2016. We've made some progress, but not enough in protecting the integrity of the actual counting of the votes and the machinery that uh, people vote on. And yet I, th I think it's fair to say that, you know, recent uh, information has come to light about, uh, you know, how insecure these voting uh, machines are, that despite uh, claims to the contrary, many of them are connected to the internet that we know that Russia was involved in probing uh, voting sites, voter registration rolls. There is still yet to be publicly disclosed the information that the FBI is not sharing with the public about how many counties in Florida were probed um, by the Russians. Uh, so we have a lot of problems. So I would go back and amend my answer about what uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris should do right off the bat. And there's a lot of good legislation that the House has already passed, including the very first bill, H.R. 1, about fixing our elections. And if I were uh, in you know, a position of advising Joe and Kamala, I would say, get with Nancy Pelosi, repass all of that legislation, send it then to a Democratic Senate, which I hope we will have, and let's get back to solving our problems and not undermining our democracy. What would you say to someone who's watching this right now and hearing all of this and thinking, wow, I now have even less confidence after learning a little bit more that my vote is going to be counted or matter in November. What would be your advice to them on the safest way to vote and make sure that their vote is counted? Well, I know that some people have that reaction. They say, oh, I didn't know all of this or now more and more information is coming to light or Trump is trying to undermine the vote that should make you more determined to vote. The idea that your vote doesn't count is an idea that is promoted by people who don't want your vote to count. So I think that um, you need to really understand that you are registered. Um, make sure, go online, make it absolutely uh, clear that you are registered and there's no problems with your registration. Number two, Decide whether you can uh, go and vote. And if your state or your county has early voting, uh, if you don't wanna go on election day, uh, then go early and make sure you uh, stay there until your vote is counted. Take a picture of your vote, take your phone with you into um, the, either the, the you know, little booth or the stand where you're voting, take a picture of your vote so you have a record that you voted and how you voted. Make sure you watch if uh, you're putting your vote into a, a machine where it's supposed to be tallied. If you're voting by mail, you know, you can drop off your vote by mail. You don't have to drop it in the post office. You know, some uh, communities are, I think, being quite civic minded by adding uh, places, drop off places that look like big mailboxes where you can drop off your ballot and then you know it's secure inside this locked uh, box. Um, you know, get, get your, your ballot back uh, in person if you can. If not, put it in the mail early enough, a couple, as soon as you get it, if you know for sure who you wanna vote for. So it's got plenty of time to be processed. And again, take a picture of your, your mail-in ballot. Take a picture of the envelope. Take a picture of every part of it. Um, make sure you follow the rules about filling out your mail-in ballot. You know, I'm hoping that when we finally see the end of, you know, the Trump administration and the obstructionist Republican Senate, we will finally pass legislation at a national level for voting standards. So it won't matter where you live. You know, 
people have been voting by mail for a really long time in states like Oregon and Washington, Colorado, Utah. They've had no problems. And so uh, there's, a, there's a myth about vote by mail that Trump wants to you know, make people nervous and, and also cause problems with it. Um, so you know, take your time, understand the rules, make sure you're registered, and then go ahead and please, please vote and get everybody you know to vote as well. Um, Michelle from Oshkosh, and then a question for me that, to build on that. Uh, Michelle wanted to know, have you and Al Gore discussed our election system and its flaws? And then my follow is, I think it was six or eight months after the 2016 election, you said that we should rethink the Electoral College. Um, do you still think that? And what should be put into the place of the Electoral College, if anything? Well, yes, Al Gore, and I have talked about this going all the way back to 2000, when, as you remember, he won the popular vote, and then the Supreme Court basically uh, decided the election, uh, which was equally outrageous in my view. And so the first time I called for the end, uh, the abolition of the Electoral College was in 2000, in reaction uh, to then Vice President Gore's uh, election outcome. So I've been on record now for 20 years. It is a remnant of the uh, compromises made with slaveholding states back at the beginning of uh, our country. And it no longer is a fair reflection of how we have moved toward one person, one vote. Uh, it should not be a uh, determinant as to who wins a national election, the person with the most votes. Uh, should win. And obviously, I feel strongly about that because I got the second highest number of votes of anybody who's ever run for president in the entire history of our country. And so it makes no sense that um, I would be deprived or Al Gore would be deprived after having won uh, a national election. Now, will it be easy um, or even possible to get rid of the Electoral College? It's very difficult because those states that really hold the election uh, in, in their hands, get a lot of extra attention. They get a lot of visits. They get a lot of you know, uh, advertising and, and attention that they obviously feel you know, is, is beneficial to them. Uh, but it's a, it's a relic uh, and it should be uh, eliminated because if we're talking about trying to ensure the sanctity of every person's vote, then in a national election, just like in a state election, when I ran for the Senate in New York twice, um, I won the most votes. Therefore, I got to serve uh, as the senator from New York. It should be the same for uh, our election of president. And, you know, let me just add, some people say, oh, but then, you know, only the big states will get attention. That is just not true. Having campaigned across the country, you know, starting in 92 uh, in my first, um, you know, presidential national campaign, that is just not true. You go places for messages that you want to convey. You go places because there are certain groups of people that you would like to, you know, be identified with. So I do not see that as a legitimate uh, objection to getting, a getting rid of the Electoral College at all. Going farther back in time a little bit, um, I recently, when it came out, watched the four-part Hulu documentary on your career. Um, and in it, you discussed your push for health care reform as first lady. And you said something along the lines of, and I'm not quoting you directly, that <laughs> in hindsight, um, given kind of all the flare ups and the tension that emerged about the, your role in that process as first lady, um, in hindsight, you might have taken more of a less public role. Um, I was wondering what your thinking was about that, you know, reflecting back on that, how you came to that conclusion, whether you feel that there was a gender element to what was going on then, and whether you would give the same advice to Chelsea or Charlotte. Oh, well, you know, thanks for watching uh, the documentary on Hulu. I've been really um, pleased by the reaction to it um, and uh, excited that it's been nominated for an Emmy. I didn't, I didn't make it, but obviously I'm in it <laughs> quite a bit, and it does not just uh, tell the story of my life, but the arc of women's lives and our politics in our country. And in reflecting back, you know, when I was first lady of Arkansas, I was a full-time practicing lawyer in addition to, you know, obviously working on, on issues that were important to the state. 
And uh, at that moment in time, way back in 1980, I don't know, 80, 83, 80, yeah, 83, I guess, um, I was asked, my husband asked me to oversee uh, an effort to reform Arkansas schools. And I, I worked really hard on it. I had a great committee working with me. We came up with very specific proposals uh, that were passed by the state legislature along with a tax actually to improve the funding for schools. It was controversial, but it was a, a, a civic endeavor. And I found it to be incredibly uh, worthwhile. And so when Bill asked me um, after the inauguration in, in uh, you know, 93, if I would be interested in doing something similar on health care, because that had been one of his, you know, principal uh, goals when he ran was to try to provide, you know, quality, affordable, universal health care for all Americans. I said, yes. And I think I, I thought that it would be more analogous to the role that I had played in Arkansas as a first lady. But it, you know, I never thought that Washington, D.C. would be, frankly, um, more difficult uh, to navigate than Arkansas. And it turned out that it was. And the expectations about what, quote, a first lady should or shouldn't do were just beginning to change. I was the first so-called boomer first lady. I had a law degree. I had been, you know, very active in my profession. And so when I took that job on, uh, it drew too much attention to me and my filling that role as opposed to the substance of what we were trying to do. And it gave, you know, just too much of a, a, a big target um, for, the, for the project because I was out front about it. I could have, you know, been very much involved but not leading it and I could have been more supportive because all I really cared about was trying to get it done. And uh, when uh, it didn't succeed and we were, you know, unable to, you know, pass legislation, um, I turned around and, and worked with members of the Senate on both sides of the aisle uh, to pass the Children's Health Insurance Program. So, you know, you just, you know, you learn as you go, but it was quite a, uh, it was quite an experience to see how much more difficult it was to be a full-time volunteer, obviously, which is what I was, uh, trying to do a project that was totally in keeping with my husband's administration's goals and just, you know, being uh, a real, you know, I was burned in effigy and lots of other stuff that you see uh, in the, the Hulu documentary. And, and I, in retrospect, you know, I'm not sure it would have made any difference in the outcome because uh, there was so much powerful opposition to, you know, doing anything on healthcare as we know still exists. Uh, but I would have um, liked to have tried, uh, you know, if I'd been not so much in the forefront uh, to see if we could have gotten something, you know, better and bigger passed. Uh, just time for a couple more questions. Unfortunately, I could, I could be here all day, but you probably have other things you need to do. Um, I was wondering, you know, we see women leaders in charge of countries such as Germany, New Zealand, um, many, many other countries other countries. What do you think accounts for the difficulties that women have had in the U.S. ascending to that top office? Um, like what are the other countries doing differently that's allowing that, ha that to happen? And kind of are there structural issues in the way we handle elections or politics in this country that could account for that difference? Amanda, I think the answers to all of your questions are yes. Um, and, and let me as just a little aside say that, you know, there's some uh, ongoing analysis about how much better countries run by women have done in the pandemic. Uh, you mentioned New Zealand and Germany, Taiwan, Finland, Denmark, places where women's leadership have, has resulted in much better outcomes for the people of those countries. Um, I think that there's a couple of uh, significant differences. Uh, we have a presidential system Many of the women who have succeeded in politics in um, other countries, both present and past, have been in a parliamentary system. If you're in a parliamentary system, you are the head of government, but you're not the head of state. Uh, and you come up through a parliamentary uh, selection process. So you're, 
your party uh, selects you as the potential leader, uh, and then uh, in a, a successful election outcome, the prime minister. And you get to show your leadership to a relatively uh, small uh, group of people who see you in action. Uh, it's like when I was in the Senate and Republicans would say, oh my gosh, I had no idea she'd be so great to work with and all of that. Well, it was because we actually worked together. So when an Angela Merkel or a Margaret Thatcher or a Jacinda Ardern or all these women are chosen by their party, they only have to run in their constituency and they can be known personally in their constituency. So if somebody says, well, you know, um, you know I, I, don't, I don't like uh, Angela Merkel in the constituency, they say, we love her, you know, we, I mean, we see her out shopping, we see her you know, just going for a walk in our parks. Um, so you get elected in your constituency, you're chosen by your party, and then if your party gets the most seats in the parliament, you become the prime minister. Our system is very, very different. You know, the party has nothing to do with deciding who gets to run for president. Anybody can run for president, and indeed, nearly anybody has run, you know, you only, you only hear about the people that have a lot of attention, but if you look at a, a lot of presidential primary ballots, you know, you, you can have a hundred people on there running for any, any, from any kind of perspective. And you also have to raise an enormous amount of money. Um, you have to build, I built a billion dollar campaign uh, in 18 months, basically. Um, and you have to withstand all kinds of attacks and, and insults and everything that goes with it um, on a big national uh, stage where it's not your constituency that has to evaluate you. It's, you know, 330 million people who have to evaluate you. So it is a more difficult route. Um, and we then only have one person, head of state and head of government, uh, which I always thought did make a difference because, you know, when you, when, when you hear some voters express a reluctance to uh, support a woman for president, um, oftentimes it's their view, uh, almost a, a, a stereotype in their own heads about what a president looks like. And uh, a president is a, you know, a, a man, number one, and predominantly a white man. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the social and cultural hurdles are, you know, still uh, significant. I think we're beginning to be more aware of them and, and wear them down. Uh, but it's, a, you know, it's a, it's a much more difficult ro road than uh, a parliamentary um, system would be. Well, given that difficult road, you just painted a very good picture of. Um, I think we have time for one more. Um, and to give you some context heading into this, I'm the same age as your daughter. Um, do you think I will be covering a woman president in my career? Oh, I hope so. I really hope so. I think, I think we, we have a very good chance of winning uh, the election with uh, the Biden-Harris ticket. So you'll be covering a, a woman vice president, I hope. Um, and then I think you saw, you know, many more women running this time. You know, I was the only woman on the stage in 08, the only woman on the stage in 16. Um, and it, it, in my primary, uh, and if, if we get more women running, something else happens, which I am very hopeful about. You know, I, I laugh because, you know, people would say things like, oh, yeah, I'll vote for a woman, just not that woman, meaning me. And then I started hearing in the 2016 primary, oh, yeah, I'd vote for a woman, not just not, you know, then naming all the women who were running. If you get more women running, then it's like more men running. You know, men come in all sizes and shapes and colors and heights, <laughs> you know, the whole deal. And so you get more women, it accustoms people to thinking about women in that highest leadership uh, position. And I think that's all to the good so that it's not just a question of representation, which is critically important. It's a question of diverse rep uh, representation. So if you see, and is the case of, you know, people who woke up after Joe Biden's selection of Kamala, you know, you see uh, a, a young black woman of, 
you know, black and Indian heritage, immigrant mother and father. And, you know, people who can relate to that are feeling like, wow, you know, I can see myself. Uh, but it was also true in the primary because there were, you know, a number of other women who were on that stage and people could then relate to them. So I'm, I'm hopeful that um, uh, I'll be around uh, to vote for a woman president, uh, assuming I agree with her. I mean, I'm not voting for any woman. <laughs> Let's get that straight. You know, I want, I want a woman who believes in women's progress and who believes that we're in a you know, a, a long, uh, important uh, reckoning with uh, racism and sexism and a lot of the other, uh, you know, deep structural problems within our society. But assuming that we have such a woman like we do with Kamala Harris, I'll be out there enthusiastically voting for her. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Clinton, for joining us today. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation and hope you stay well. A lot of members of the Pantsuit Nation submitted questions basically saying they hope you're uh, getting the self-care that you need. So, I'll Oh, that's so nice. I love the Pantsuit Nation and thank you all so much. And great to talk to you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you so much to Amanda and to Secretary Clinton for that terrific conversation. Next up, I'm so pleased to return to Amanda for a second keynote today with Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. We're thrilled to have Representative Elise Stefanik here with us to discuss women in representation uh, heading into the November election. Welcome, Congresswoman. Great to be here, Amanda, and very excited about the 19th launch. Thank you. We are having fun so far, and we're just two weeks into it, so hopefully a lot more to come. Um, one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to you today for the, for the summit is because you a few years ago, after the 2018 elections, looked at kind of the field of candidates and decided you wanted to do something extra to encourage women to, you know, ascend in the Republican Party to run for House of Representative seats. Um, that year, of course, we saw a historic influx of Democratic women to the House and you were among the people who were trying to replicate that on the other side of the aisle. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your PAC that you started, EPAC, and some of your candidates, and kind of what uh, you're looking at heading into November. Absolutely. So thank you for asking that question. I am a believer that we need to have diversity in Congress in both parties. And while the 2018 elections we did see for the first time in our nation's history, over 100 women were elected to Congress, which was very exciting. There were only 13 Republican women in that very large class. And it was not something that I went into 2019 planning to do. But when they introduced the incoming freshmen, they lined up all the new Republican members. And there was only one woman, Carol. Miller from West Virginia. And it really struck me that it was not reflective of the American people. It was not reflective of our voters. So I really sounded the alarm. And there was some pushback originally saying that that's outdated identity politics to specifically focus on recruiting and supporting Republican women. But I was also pleased to build support among leadership. So Kevin McCarthy signed on board, Steve Scalise, and many of my other colleagues. Why is this important? This is important because when we achieve parity in elected office, you have to do so in both parties. It's also important because women voters and American women are diverse in their political opinions. Um, while the Democratic Party has very, had a very effective ecosystem with EMILY's List and other outside organizations, we need to build that ecosystem on the Republican Party. So my PAC has been focused on not just recruiting uh, women to run for office, but investing and setting metrics that they have to meet so we can identify who the top tier candidates are. And the models really worked. There have been great stories of success, frankly, in both parties of the historic number of women running for federal office in the 2020 election cycle. Great stories in the New York Times, NPR, Bloomberg, the Boston Globe, not typically outlets that highlight the successes of Republican women, but really exciting to see that not only did we have over 260 women file to run, 74 will be on the ballot uh, this November in the general election. Yes, so that's something I've been tracking with the primary results so far. Uh, you're right, it's up to at least, um, I believe, actually 78 now Republican women who will be on the ballot. You know, you mentioned uh, identity politics being a barrier and the resistance to that. 
and also getting these women financial support. Um, when you ran, you were actually the youngest um, member of the House of Representatives at the time. Um, you're still the youngest Republican woman ever elected to the House of Representatives. I have to imagine that fundraising and getting your race started was really daunting. And I was wondering, you know, kind of what would you tell a woman who maybe hasn't been in politics before, maybe is, you know, on the younger side, this is new to them. Um, what kind of role does EPAC and the other organizations that have sprung up to help women do in terms of helping women kind of financially get their campaigns off the ground? Great question. So the first advice I give to not just women candidates, but really any candidate is you need to take the time to sit down, open an Excel spreadsheet and write down who your supporters are. So who, who are those first people you are going to pick up the phone and call, whether it's your friends from nursery school and elementary school that you grew up with, whether it's former colleagues, whether it's friends from college, basically trying to build out your network of support. And then of course you can ask them, can you introduce me to people in my community, in my district that are interested in supporting candidates? Um, that's really important. What I found when I was first running, and I was 28 years old at the time when I started the process, I did not know I would be the youngest woman ever elected to Congress. I found that out after I won my primary. But um, initially, that was viewed as a weakness, and we very effectively turned that into a strength. People in this country are looking for new generation voices. They're looking for strong leadership coming from diverse backgrounds. So what was initially a weakness, especially from the political quote unquote experts, ended up being a really appealing aspect of our campaign beyond party lines, you know, across demographics, both men and women, but also across age groups. So I would say for candidates, building out that donor list is important. What the PAC does, what my leadership PAC is focused on, is setting out those metrics. So we ask our candidates to build a strong campaign team, build a great grassroots email list, make sure that you're able to raise that first bit of campaign money yourself. And the reason that's important is it forces you to put together a strong campaign and really hone your message. And then we work with them to continue to develop their team, to develop their campaign budget, their message, their ad strategy, as they work through the primaries and then on to the general. Congresswoman, you were also at the NRCC in charge of recruitment earlier in your career. Um, there you recruited a record number, I believe it was just over 100 women to run, um, but you were seeing that they didn't get through their primaries. And so I was wondering, you know, you created EPAC to kind of fill this void where the National Party can't always step in and help candidates in the primary. Kind of what role do they fill? How do they change the game by helping women get through those primaries in order to get them onto the general election ballot? I was the first woman to chair recruitment at the NRCC. And what was interesting about the 2018 sec, uh, uh, midterms is that we did have the highest number of Republican women who filed to run, but many of them did not win their primaries. And that was another impetus behind starting EPAC was to provide that financial support as early as possible to get our strongest women candidates through primaries. And frankly, again, on the other side of the aisle, the Democratic Party has a lot of outside groups that play in primaries to support women, such as Emily's List and other organizations. And I think that model on the Republican side has been growing. There's a growing number of organizations, whether it's My PAC, whether it's View PAC, Value in Electing Women PAC, whether it's Maggie's List, Winning for Women. So that's good to have those resources and ecosystem early on. But that was a big lesson, Amanda, is it's not just about the recruitment, it's developing strong campaigns and making sure that there is a message for these strong women candidates to win the primary and be positioned well for the general election. So there are 78 Republican women so far on ballot House ballots in November, and that number will likely go up because not every state is finished with their primaries, essentially, because some of them were delayed due to coronavirus. Um, many of these women are actually running in what are expected to be some of the most competitive races in the country. Do you think that that's a coincidence, or do you think there's something about female candidates that uniquely suits them to maybe be competitive in areas um, that are that are real, going to be really tight in November. I think it's a good, it's an important question. So if you look at the success of the Democrat candidates in swing districts in the midterms, a lot of those first time candidates who won were women. So this is something that we see in both parties. 
uh, specifically this cycle as we head into 2020. I focused on making sure that we have candidates, not just in those swing districts, but also the red districts. And the reason why that's important is oftentimes those districts, the uh, elected official is able to gain seniority, whether it's committee chair positions or leadership positions in the party. But when it comes to the swing districts, women candidates are very effective at communicating their unique background. So whether you're a mom, whether you own a business, women are juggling everything all the time. I mean, if you want to know who are the busiest people, it is women. So I think that makes women very effective candidates and specifically effective communicators. We know that the battleground in 2020 in many of these congressional districts is the suburbs. And to have suburban moms, to have strong women who have maybe been on the PTA, on the school board, elected at the state or local level, uh, they are going to be strong candidates on the ballot this November. And I actually was in Indiana recently, um, and I profiled the race there in Indiana 5. I spoke to one of the candidates that EPAC backs, Victoria Sparts in Indiana's 5th District. And I was wondering, are there any other races that you think are really interesting that EPAC has been involved in? I think I saw a couple weeks ago you had raised, um, helped raise seven, 750000 for these women candidates. Um, what races should people be watching? There's a number of races. So the Indiana race, that's a seat that is uh, open. Susan Brooks is retiring. Susan is a dear friend, a very effective policymaker. Uh, Victoria Sparks has an incredible personal story uh, in terms of growing up in uh, Ukraine and uh, immigrating to the United States, building a successful uh, small business, as well as her advocacy on the state level. She's built a lot of support for her candidacy. Some others I would highlight, uh, Ashley Hinson, who is running in a key seat in Iowa. This is a swing district, Iowa one. She's a former state senator, former news anchor, and she was one of the first candidates I met who reached out to me and said, I read the articles about EPAC. I want to run. Let's meet up and talk about it. And it was very early on in 2019. Another candidate is Young Kim, who is running in California. She would be the first Korean American woman ever elected to the United States Congress. She uh, previously served for the former representative Ed Royce as one of his key district staffers. She also owns a number of small businesses with her husband, is a mom, and is just one of the hardest working candidates out there. In addition, we have candidates in Texas, some of those targeted seats. Uh, Beth Van Dyne, who is a former mayor of Irving. She is running in an open seat held by Pete Olson as well as Genevieve Collins, who's around my age. She's a former Division I collegiate athlete. She helps run and really help, has helped grow her family's educational technology business, which is a tremendous success and job creator. She's running hard in a swing district down there. So we have a ton of amazing stories. And I think that's important. an important part of this, Amanda, is telling their stories, because these are unique glass ceiling crackers uh, in terms of their backgrounds. And I was very disappointed, for example, after the 2018 midterms, Elle Magazine did a feature on all the newly elected women in Congress, and they left out the one Republican. And that's not acceptable. So I think it's important that you represent a diversity of women who have diverse opinions. Um, before we switch gears to a different topic, I wanted to work in some questions from our viewers and readers. Uh, Jennifer and Austin, I'll start with one um, in the city where the 19th is based. Wanted to know what words of encouragement do you have for conservative women who are discouraged by our party in the tone and rhetoric emanating from the top? I would say you should run for office. Every district is different. Every community is different. And what I find when I meet with candidates, the single strongest indicator of a successful candidate is the fire in the belly and understanding why you're running for office. And it's almost always about serving your district or a particular issue of importance to your community. So, you know, if you want to have an impact, I would say really step up and run for office. In Texas in particular, there's a lot of interesting things happening in Texas. You are seeing diverse candidates step up in both parties. And, um, you know, it's going to have to be a governing uh, party in Texas that is going to win future generations there. Uh, and Republicans, you know, the governor has focused on this, uh, the Republican governor in Texas and continues to be very popular, but ensuring that there are diverse candidates up and down the ballot. 
Um, and then another from Tara, because this is related, and Tara did not list her location. Um, she wants to know, and this is her question, and it, it, you know, uh, I guess very grassroots, de definitive steps is what she's asking for. And she asked, how does a little nobody like me go from being a working mom to running for a publicly held office? I want to run. I want to make change. I don't know where to start. Well, I will tell you, it is, it's really about being proactive. Again, when I decided to run for Congress, not many people thought it was a good idea, particularly some of the party leadership in uh, the National Republican Congressional Committee who did not support when I ran the first time until I resoundingly won my primary. Um, I cold called, I cold emailed various party leaders at the county level, at the town level. I would go to local events. I would drive four hours to speak to four people. Uh, if this was sometimes with, it was snowing, you know, you have 20 inches of snow up here in the winter time in my district. So don't undersell yourself. People are really blown away when you show that you're proactive and are going to work hard. And I think women candidates are incredibly hard workers. They don't take it um, as, a, as though it's given to them. They want to earn it. So I would say, you know, email uh, the county chairs, email town chairs, email community leaders, small business leaders, and sit down with them. Ask if they would be willing to get a cup of coffee or if you could drop by their office for 15 minutes just to introduce yourself and say you're interested in running. There's no set instruction manual. And again, some of my peers and friend group thought I was, uh, thought it wasn't possible, but I would just cold email these county chairs in my district and meet with them. And did you get a good response? Were they open to it, some of these people who you contacted? Absolutely. And I think they were sort of blown away and they will tell me stories now. These are my most ardent supporters that I, uh, you know, when I showed up, they'd think, oh my gosh, she doesn't look like a typical congressional candidate. How's this going to work out? But, you know, we built very strong uh, professional relationships in terms of strong campaigns. They became some of my biggest supporters, the people that I still call to this day to get out lawn signs. So I think people are open minded in general because those that are involved in politics, particularly at the grassroots level, they appreciate proactivity. They appreciate someone who's a doer and is going to go out there and introduce themselves. It's hard. You can't really be a wallflower in politics and people don't maybe realize this about me, but I'm actually a closeted introvert. So I have to really focus on making sure that I'm getting out there. You know, I was the kid who, you know, I had a lot of friends growing up, but I also loved reading. I loved, um, you know, I was able to uh, uh, entertain myself as a child in terms of playing in my room. I didn't need constant uh, attention. So I, even as an introvert, you were able to do that by just talking about why you're running, what issues are important. And you have mentioned grassroots level a couple of times. If someone contacted you for advice now, what would be the calculation you would recommend to them about um, running for the house versus running for the state house or a uh, city council or something more on the state or local level? Uh, kind of what factors should women consider? Those questions happen all of the time. You know, when I meet with candidates and I met with many who have decided to run and many who have decided not to run for Congress and have chosen state or local level instead. And, you know, usually I, I judge it on a case by case basis about whether they're focused on federal issues or whether they are really focused on a local issue where they can have an impact more effectively at the local level. So I think having those conversations is important because it helps guide you in the right direction. The other thing that I tell candidates is that I'm really straightforward is this is not glamorous. It is incredibly hard work. Uh, in order to be a successful candidate, you have to be accessible out there, you know, constantly being out in the community, taking phone calls 24 seven. And um, you of course can do it, but you just need to go into it eyes wide open. And now we will switch gears a little bit. Um, we are still in the middle of a pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. And I wondered how you and your family are doing, um, you know, where you've kind of spent your quarantine days, um, how your district's doing, what is the situation like in your district in New York? 
Well, thank you for asking. Uh, families are certainly working through this unprecedented challenge. New York State is the epicenter of the COVID crisis. If you look at the numbers of tragic deaths related to COVID, I represent the northernmost district in New York, and we actually have had the lowest COVID rates. And I really credit our county public health officials, many of whom are women, and our local hospitals and community health centers and uh, the partnerships we have at the federal, state, and local level in terms of getting out all the proper information from CDC, all of the health guidance. It has been a challenge for everyone, uh, particularly for small businesses locally. There's a lot of tourist-based small businesses in my economy that have really, really faced challenges. What I've focused on is in times of crisis, uh, and this is how I run my congressional office, you need to be more available than ever. And we really triaged all of the incoming requests, particularly at the start of the crisis where there were you know, hundreds of calls every single day on making sure that people could track down stimulus payments, clarification uh, questions and requests for the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, for example, because of those seasonal businesses, they were not initially eligible. I literally helped rewrite the guidance for, uh, from the Department of Treasury for seasonal businesses so that they were eligible for this economic rescue package for small businesses. In terms of my own family, you know, we are all juggling it. We have all learned how to do Zoom and uh, safely social distance. I am getting out and about to events. I've done a number of events this week, but we're following proper protocol, wearing a mask, socially distancing, not having large events, seating people six feet apart. And that's been, you know, I, I think it's been a success because People have been getting stir crazy in some ways. And I think to have those socially distanced uh, events, it's some sense of normalcy, even though it's completely not what we would have imagined in 2019. Uh, but I, you know, we're gonna keep working through it and we're gonna keep working to provide the resources that are needed. Uh, the pandemic has also changed campaigning. I mean, as a reporter, um, this summer would have normally been very busy for me. I would have been out on the campaign trail. Um, I have been a tiny bit, but not much, because uh, no one is holding campaign campaign events in the same way. And I, you know, given that a lot of your EPAC candidates are first time candidates, they are challengers um, in many cases to incumbents. Um, they are trying to flip seats. Uh, they need to be out there. What has your advice been to your candidates, and how have you been able to be a resource to them in the same way you are to your constituents? So campaigns have pivoted on a dime, and it's not just digital efforts, but effectively using phone calls, using text messaging, using all the 21st century technology that we have, using Zoom meetings. Um, and people have been creative. We are still having events in my district, but for example, on the 4th of July, we had a reverse parade where typically the candidates walk in the parade. This time the candidates stayed stationary on the sideline and people safely drove through in their vehicles. So the community members drove through in their vehicles to wave to each of the candidates uh, from the side. So people are adjusting. And I think the strong campaigns are um, nimble in that they know how to change. And it also is a testament, if you have a strong email list, a strong digital presence, you're able to adjust to this new reality. But it's certainly been a challenge and it's unprecedented at the presidential level as well in terms of, you know, the Trump campaign is focused on grassroots, safely door knocking when possible. And the Biden campaign has chosen a very different route doing zero door knocking. There was a headline saying there were a million door, lock, door knocks for the Trump campaign, zero for Biden. So I think it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out as we head to November. And one more coronavirus related question from a viewer before we move on. Uh, Shoshana in Scottsdale, Arizona said she would love to hear your perspective on the return to schools in New York. How are you ensuring families in your district remain safe while still providing quality education? This is a question on every single parent's mind right now. Absolutely. And it particularly impacts working women. As I've talked to working women in this district who have really juggled a lot this past spring and in some cases are in really challenging economic circumstances. It has been a learning, a lot of lessons learned over what works and what doesn't work with the digital only learning. When our local school districts polled parents, in most cases over 90% of the parents who answered said they wanted their kids to have 
some significant form of in-person learning. I will credit our superintendents at the K through 12 level. They put forth really well thought out uh, proposals to ensure that the workers, the teachers, the administrative staff, the students and their families are safe. So in some cases that's rotating class days. In some cases that's expanding. You know, one teacher was telling me that they took down basically everything in the room so that they could socially distance all of the desks. Making sure that schools have proper PPE is going to be important as well. I do think there's a federal piece with federal funding that's needed directly to K through 12 school districts because there's a significant cost as they update their operations to ensure that they are safe and healthy during this COVID pandemic. And, you know, that's a good point to ask. What is the status of the latest relief package in Congress? Um, it's my understanding the House is recessed until, I think, September 13th, unless you need to come back to vote on a coronavirus-related package. Um, what is the status of that? Can people expect to see some of these things, like the, the added unemployment benefits, extended? I think we do need to have a bipartisan compromise on this. It is clear that there is a need for additional relief, uh, whether that's making sure that small, small businesses are able to go, for example, for a second round of paycheck protection program in targeted industries. Direct aid to K through 12 schools is really important. Additional support for hospitals, rural hospitals in my district, even though we didn't have a lot of positive COVID cases, cases they had significant economic challenges because of the pause on all elective surgeries. And then, of course, local aid. My counties and municipalities are facing very challenging fiscal circumstances. I am strongly supporting direct local aid uh, for COVID-related costs. So I'm hopeful. Again, we, you know, if they come together and I'm urging them to come together to a compromise solution, we'll be called back in 24 hours. Otherwise, we will be back in session in September. But I think we need to get something done on behalf of the American people. Um, and on a happier topic, we are approaching um, in just days the 100th anniversary of women winning the right to vote. Um, your home state of New York had some very important things that happened there. I was wondering if there are any suffrage celebration preparations underway in New York um, that you're excited about. Absolutely. So my district is the hometown of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was born and raised in Johnstown, New York, and is something that we're very, very proud of in upstate New York. She played such an important leadership role in the women's suffrage movement uh, and also was a key leader in Seneca Falls. In addition, Susan B. Anthony was a teacher in my district and actually not that far from where I live uh, was where there's a historic site where she spent a number of years teaching a local family as their tutor. So the suffrage movement has very deep ties to upstate New York, much like the founding of our country. I mean, I live a couple miles from the Saratoga battlefield, which turned the tides in our favor during the Revolutionary War. And we certainly will be celebrating the 100th anniversary. This is an important centennial. It's an important marker. And legislatively, I'm really excited that I passed a bill that the U.S. Mint will be minting coins that are commemorating this important centennial, an example of a bipartisan bill that was signed into law. Um, and on that note of bipartisanship, another viewer question. We get a variation of this question for every single event that I do. Nicole in the state of Washington wants to know, in what ways do you model civility, something that seems to be so lost in our political discourse right now. How do you model civility when working with colleagues from across the aisle or when facing criticism from someone you may see as the other? It's an important question and I think people are yearning for civility. Uh, if you look at my record, I am in the top 5% most bipartisan members of Congress according to my votes and my co-sponsorship. I'm also one of the most independent members of Congress and Sometimes the media likes to define people in their own lens, but I'm a big believer in, at look at the record. And that bipartisanship means that you have to demonstrate an ability day to day to reach out across the aisle. I do that on my committees. I have an amazing working relationship with my colleague, Jim Langevin, uh, who is a Democrat from Rhode Island on the House Armed Services Committee. 
He is the chair, I am the ranking member of a really important subcommittee on emerging threats. We deal with cyber issues, technology issues for the Department of Defense. In addition, at the local level, I find that most district issues have bipartisan uh, support. So another example in my district is I represent a large swath of the U.S.-Canadian border. It's really important to our economy, and I'm co-chair of the Northern Border Caucus, which is bipartisan. So my colleague and I, both from New York, Brian Higgins from the Buffalo area, have really been working together to get more clarity on the safe reopening of the Northern Border, which has been uh, really uh, limited in terms of the border crossings during this crisis. So I think you have to find issues and really demonstrate an ability over time that you are a bipartisan workhorse. And, and it's interesting, in, in the halls of Congress, you know which offices are bipartisan and which are not. So you tend to see a lot of the bipartisan offices working together. Um, one more question. I think we have time for one more from Cameron in Long Beach. Uh, they wanted to know uh, if Trump loses and you have become closer to Trump over the past year, what are your next steps in the short term? What do you see yourself doing next? Well, I'm running for election in November. Uh, that's what I'm focused on. My district is a really big district, and I always say I have 194 towns, and you know I put hundreds of thousands of miles on my car driving around the district. Uh, I have worked. You know, we have a tendency to look at things through the lens of the present, but it's important to note that when I was first elected, President Obama was president, and I worked effectively with President Obama, just like I worked effectively with President Trump. So that ability to get things done, I think, is really important. I'll highlight. One of the biggest legislative victories and results I delivered working with a president of an opposing party was the largest fix to the Affordable Care Act was a bill that I introduced that President Obama signed into law as part of a big legislative package at the end of the year. So, you know, I, my job as a member of Congress is to work with the president to deliver results. And I have a record of doing so with both uh, Democratic presidents and with a Republican president. I think that is all the time we have for today, unfortunately, Congresswoman. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, up next, we'll have a word from our presenting sponsors, Intuit and Goldman Sachs, as well as some trivia to see how much you know about the women who fought for a seat at the table in America and beyond. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. It is a little difficult to navigate as a woman in business. And I think the best way to get through it is just to be aware of the differences and be yourself. For me, how I found how to navigate through that is I just had to be more confident in myself and be more confident in my accolades. It's a very enriching thing to be connected with other women in business. Just hearing other women's stories really just made it more achievable. When a woman leads a business, she will always have more than one bottom line. Her shareholders are her community. Her success is measured not only by dividends and profits, but by the path she creates for others to follow. Being a part of the 10,000 Women program has made me daring.
Next up, we've got something truly magical for you and months in the making. Three performances by the New York Philharmonic featuring composers Cameron Cowan, Valerie Coleman, and Jessica Mays. This will blow your mind. Watch and listen. Thank you. 
We've got a terrific panel discussion keyed up for you next on the question so many of us have asked over the years, when will a woman win the presidency? The 19th editor-at-large, Aaron Haynes, will ask that question and more to Kelly Dittmar, an assistant professor of political science at Rutgers, a Hawaii congresswoman and former presidential hopeful, Tulsi Gabbard, and author Jennifer Palmieri, the former communications director for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Well, welcome to our panelists. So excited to have this conversation, although I can hardly believe that we're still having it in 2020. Uh, but our panel is titled, When Will a Woman Win? And so I want to start our conversation by putting that question to each one of you. Um, I think it's uh, when, not if. You know, uh, I think Hillary proved that it was possible. She did get, she did get three million more votes. Um, it could have easily gone either way. And I think it will happen when a woman wins. It is still harder for women candidates than it is for male candidates, but it is not impossible. And the thing about um, you know, running for office is Congresswoman Kelly, everybody can attest to, uh, women, because it is slightly harder, I think they're better political athletes at the end of the process and they come back stronger. And you know, once you get through a primary, you have a very good chance of winning a general. So it's a yin yang, it's harder, but it means that the women come in kind of hotter in terms of as in terms of their performance and I think it can be you know next cycle yeah congresswoman Gabbard I see you nodding your head there uh what are your thoughts on this I can relate to a lot of things that Jennifer is talking about I was just thinking back to I was 21 when I first ran for the state house here in Hawaii had no like debate training or speaking uh experience as a very very introverted young woman and just went out and started knocking on doors. But I remember back at that time, um, there were no real training resources or mentorship groups or, or allies that I could turn to to say, hey, how do I do this? Or what do I say when I pick up the phone and call a stranger and ask them for money? All of those things were totally foreign to me. And it's just really incredible to see how far we have come all across the country, you know, small towns, big cities, states, national races, to see more and more women running and to be equipped with so many more tools. So I 100% I agree that it is a matter of when, not if, and that with this progression over time, what we're seeing is the building of an incredibly powerful pipeline of women who will seek these higher offices, bringing a, a great diversity of experience with them. Kelly, what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, I agree that it is when. The question, of course, is exactly when, and none of us know. Uh, I, I appreciate Jennifer's optimism, and I sort of want to stick with that as well, that it'll be sooner than later. I think there's real palpable frustration um, at the underrepresentation of women at the presidential level. Um, I think that is true across our institutions right now, but it will play out in politics as well. We saw that in 2018. I think we're seeing it again in 2020. Um, one thing I would just put into context, of course, is that women have been running for president uh, since 1872. Uh, and so we do actually have a long history here, which maybe uh, points to a more pessimistic outlook that it's taken this long. But on the other hand, all of the women who have done it, who have run, including the Congresswoman, including um, our first woman nominee uh, for a major party in 2016, I think have chipped away and softened the ground at some of these biases that have made it hard for women to get to this level. And so from Shirley Chisholm to Margaret Chase Smith to the women, the six women who ran in 2020, they're all helping to seed the ground for the next women so that it's hopefully a little bit easier and that the public is also a little bit more ready um, to really embrace the value added that women would bring to the White House. All such good points. Uh, I mean, Kelly, you started talking about this, so I want to continue with you. I mean, what would you say is the greatest barrier to breaking this ceiling and why does it persist? Yeah, I don't think there's one thing you can point to, but I do think that the expectations, the sort of stereotypical expectations of this office play a big role. So I've often said, you know, the presidency is the most masculine institution in American politics. And we see our current president playing totally into that, right? So I'm going to prove that I'm the most manly person and therefore that makes me qualified to be president. Well, that's a challenge for women just by nature of 
gender expectations. Uh, so we've seen women historically feel like, okay, I've got to prove that I meet these masculine credentials because that's what the office is demanding. Thankfully, over time, uh, we've seen women really shift and say, no, maybe we should rethink what we value in this office instead of me as a woman candidate having to adjust to these norms that were really set up to benefit particularly white men, right? So um, I think that masculine dominance and particularly sort of white masculine dominance in the presidency, not only in who holds the office, but in what we expect of those office holders and what we value in them uh, is what has to change in order for there to be a woman who can navigate a presidential campaign most successfully, and again, sort of prove that value added that she brings. Yeah, I want to ask you about this, uh, Congresswoman Gabbard, because you uh, were uh, you were somebody who was in uh, this this field uh, in 2020 as one of the six the historic six women that ran for president. Uh, wh what would you say was the greatest barrier uh, that that you faced while you were on the campaign trail? Uh, you know, I, and this is very appropriate that we're talking about it on this platform, but the media continues to play an outsized role in how voters are getting information about different candidates, how they're perceiving different candidates. And I'll just use one example. Uh, in this last presidential primary, we had three uh, military veterans who were running for president, myself, uh, uh, Seth Moulton, and Pete Buttigieg. I lost track, I lost count of how many articles I saw come out saying, you know, it's great to see veterans running for president like Seth Moulton and Pete Buttigieg. I, I respect both of them, but oftentimes I found myself like, yeah, hi, uh, I have served in the military longer than both of them and have these unique experiences that I bring to offer. Um, something like that might seem small to someone else, but you see the kind of impact that that has in, uh, and this is not limited to male journalists or female journalists, but you see the kind of impact that has on someone who's just picking up the Sunday paper or reading a quick headline uh, when, you know, I get erased as, as the female combat veteran running for president. So that's one example. I guarantee the other women who ran for president have, have other stories, but uh, this is, this is, I think, one of the biggest things that really needs to evolve and change um, as we go forward if we hope to have a different outcome. Erin, you know, I would say, like, I think one of those uh, helpful sort of grounding things for people to hear is that when Hillary ran, when I went to join her campaign in 2015, I did not think it was going to be that hard or that big of a deal to elect the first woman president. And Kelly's oh, laughing at me. But, you know, <laughs> that was, that was pre-Trump. And I think we thought, I thought, you know, I've worked for President Obama and I thought electing the first black president in America was far harder. And I had worked for President Obama. I had worked for President Clinton. I mean, anybody will tell you I had been through crises. I know how to handle them in politics. And when I went into the Clinton campaign, I just walked into this insane buzzsaw, you know, where everything you touch, it's like the instrument just goes wacky. It's you, 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 you know, I described it at the time as the Hillary distortion field, but it's like the female candidate distortion field. And I think it's very hard for us to pin this stuff down because it is, it's unconscious. It's not, and, and, and the Congresswoman, I'm sure will agree with this, which is that Democrats sometimes are the most blind to gender bias because we're so sure that we're not sexist. We're so sure that we're not racist. That's, look at her laughing. You know, that like, well, you know, there's just something about Hillary Clinton I don't trust. And it can't possibly be because as I now believe that I, this is what I believe. I believe that we were suspicious about Hillary um, and had been suspicious about her for decades because for decades, she was always stepping outside of the role that women normally played. There's something confounding about that. There's something a little vexing. There's something about her I just don't like. And it doesn't mean that everybody who didn't, who, who felt that way is sexist. It's like, I just don't, she's doing something women don't normally do. And that sounds sort of trite and dated in 2016 or 2020, but it's real that, that we don't know, we don't have a model to look at for what that, to recognize a woman in that, and that in that role. Now, because she ran, because she did relatively well, this time we had six women. And the women that ran in 2020, they still faced questions about electability and what are you gonna, are you likable enough? And what are you gonna do about the Hillary problem? But this time 
we all, you know, everybody on this call, we all jumped on the <laughs> press when they did that, right? And now the 19th exists. So I do see that progress being made, but I think part of the reason why it is hard to get over this hump is because it's all this sort of inherent, you know, in the Merck bias. It's not an active will to stop women. That's not what it's at play. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, again, as, as all of us have mentioned, we saw a 2020 Democratic primary with a historic six women running for president. Uh, and yet these gender narratives persisted four years after, to Kelly's point, Hillary Clinton made history as the first woman to be the nominee of a major party in American politics. And after she won the popular vote with the second highest number of votes for a Democrat ever behind Barack Obama. And then this year, we saw, we saw these six women. In 2016, it was, to Jen's point, you know, oh, I don't know, there's just something about Hillary that's making me not want to vote for her. This year, what I heard a lot, and Kelly, you and I talked about this, oh, well, it's not that I wouldn't vote for a woman. I'm not sure about my neighbor. I'm not, some, I'm not sure about somebody in a swing state. Um, talk a little bit, Kelly, about the difference between 2016 when it was about one woman versus the excuses that were made to not vote for any of the six women who were running for president this yes. year. I mean, this speaks to exactly Jen's point, right, which is, is that you find these excuses because of that implicit bias that you have, right? You're still really concerned about the fact that a woman could do this job. So some of what we saw this year in terms of questions around electability was what we would call social desirability bias. Like, yeah, I, I would, but somebody else would. No, you probably wouldn't either. Um, but some of it was real fear about electability because of the sexism that folks had seen really glaringly in the Clinton campaign, right? Um, so, and beyond, right? Especially in this environment uh, in a Trump presidency, where we've seen sexism actually help him win. I mean, that's what the studies show, that folks who are more likely to have sexist beliefs were those who supported Donald Trump. And so he played into that. Um, and so there was a combination of, of things that I think ultimately created what I've talked about as sort of a double burden for the women candidates. So not only did each woman candidate have to run a campaign to prove she was the best qualified person for the job, just like all the guys in the field. She also had to convince donors, practitioners, and voters that she could actually win. Um, and I, when I talked to a, a strategist for Stacey Abrams' campaign from 2018, she talked about this as having to wage a campaign of belief. And I think that that is really important and just this added burden uh, that women have. And until they don't have to do that, in addition to running their regular campaign, it's going to be hard for them to be successful. And so it's up to us as voters, media practitioners, to see that women are, in fact, electable. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to talk about the word that we all keep bringing up, uh, electability, which was a word that made me cringe a lot on the campaign trail this year. And so I can only imagine how it made some of you feel. And I want to ask about that. Uh, I want to start by asking each of you, uh, what do you hear when you hear the word electability? Congresswoman Gabbard, I'll start with you. Yeah, I hate this word. Uh, this is, um, when I hear electability, all I hear is uh, maybe a view that is being funneled through whatever filter background experience uh, by the speaker or whoever is putting forward that certain argument of electability or not. And to me, it was um, so often disconnected from just everyday voters who are trying to, you know, pick through, okay, I want to learn more about this candidate, that candidate, that candidate, based on, you know, who they are, what their experience is, uh, what their policies are, how they would make decisions on issue X, Y, or Z, and then making the decision based on that. Um, when you end up having, you know, so much of this noise around electability, to me, it just really muddled this already difficult decision that voters are trying to make about choosing the person that they trust and that they want to see hold, uh, hold this office. Yeah, uh, Jen, you wrote a whole book about this. Uh, I <laughs> want to ask you, I mean, when do you think we're gonna be able to move past this electability myth in our politics and what is it gonna take? I mean, I think it's honestly, I hate to say it's gonna take a woman to win, right? You know, it is like the, the thing is, is that the electability question it lets voters off the hook. It lets them say like, well, you know, I would love for a woman, but a woman can't win. Therefore, I don't have to confront any of any of the qualities about a woman leader that make me uncomfortable. Right. And it gives you an, a convenient out. Um, it, 
a convenient out for it. And of course, just by asking the question, it becomes self-fulfilling because the women have to battle that. Meanwhile, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, Congresswoman won plenty of, plenty of races prior to running for Congress, um, excuse me, prior to running for president, the women senators, every single one of them had won every race they had ever been in. Um, they are winners and like partly because it is so hard for women, you know, we buy into young, ambitious men without a lot of experience because we recognize them right away. Their, 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 our history is, is filled with their stories. So we see Pete Buttigieg, easy for me to say, we see Pete Buttigieg and we're like, oh, this ambitious, earnest young man, well, he's such a go-getter. And then you see Tulsi Gabbard, who was probably like maybe a year older than him, I think, maybe not, or, you know, same. Um, and it's, you know, well, who does she think she is running for president at this young age? And, you know, the women who ended up doing the best, Amy Klobuchar, Elizabeth Warren, they broke relatively late because it takes a long time for us to buy into women. They have to prove that they have a record of experience and it takes a long time for us to get to know them. So they have to have a long lead time. But, you know, women continue to win despite all of these challenges and women continue to run despite all these challenges. It's the number of women who are willing to run that makes me really optimistic about us winning in the future because it means we believe in our gut that despite all of how hard it all is we should do this and it's important to do it and it, it's going to be a factor until someone proves that it can be done and having the first female vice president would be a good start yeah uh, Kelly, I want to ask you about about uh, the, the record number of women, uh, you know, not only who, who ran and, and won in 2018, but but it looks like that scenario is setting itself up again in 2020. And I know that your uh, organization has done uh, is doing research that's keeping us all informed about kind of the, the state of play here uh, headed into November. Talk a little bit about uh, where women are uh, in, in running for, for these offices and, and proving, again, uh, the, the, the uh, myth of electability. Yeah. So obviously in 2018, everybody saw the record numbers of women, not only running, but winning. And they were winning in the most competitive places. Like that's the piece that we also need to pay attention to. Women were responsible for flipping the majority of seats from Republican to Democrat. That's why we have a Democratic House. Um, so this idea that somehow they aren't electable, especially in these competitive states and purple districts, they are. And they proved it in 2018. Um, in 2020, we're seeing another record number of women running. And positively, for those of us who know that we can't get to parity, gender parity on one side of the aisle, we're seeing more Republican women running this cycle. Um, so we have a record number of Republican women candidates for the US House and the Senate. Um, we're up to about 583 overall women candidates for the House, just for comparison. Um, we were at 476 um, in the last cycle. So if we continue to see those those increases in candidacies, hopefully that also means we'll see an increased number of women who win and serve. Um, and then again, I think that does start to disrupt expectations around not only electability, but also what we expect in political leaders, what they bring to the table, what sorts of experience and perspectives we value. We also saw diversity among the women um, who were running and winning in the last cycle. And again, this year, a record number of women of color. We had our first Native American women in Congress, our first Muslim women in Congress. So all of these gains start to challenge expectations that a political leader looks like a white male of a certain age, right? And that they, they have to have these three, you know, sets of qualifications in order to do the job well. I think all of the, the women running are helping to uh, really challenge those expectations and hopefully that sets it up for disruption at the top level. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanna go to, um, you, Representative Gabbard, because I think we share another pet peeve, which is the phrase women's issues, right? Uh, at the 19th, we believe that all issues are women's issues, and that belief is part of the reason that our newsroom exists, uh, to reflect women as the issues voters who make up the majority of the electorate and not just a special interest group with limited concerns. So I would love for you to give another example as, as a woman in politics of how you have faced disparate treatment. Um, gosh, there, there's, I, I, I look back to, you know, pick one if you can, <laughs> I know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> uh, 
but both both in politics and you know I'm, I'm continuing to serve in the army reserves another uh very male dominated profession um yeah you know i i was frustrated when i first you know, I, I ran for state and local office where a lot of the issues were really, really like, you know, potholes, sewers, bread and butter issues. Uh, but it was when I started to run for Congress that I really started to feel kind of this pigeonhole of, of uh, women's issues when for me and my own experience, having had a couple deployments in the Middle East, having, you know, my own concerns about a lot of things that uh, extended beyond reproductive health, which is usually what people refer to when they talk about women's issues, it really confused me that that uh, the perception was that as a woman, as a woman candidate running for Congress at that time, uh, that that I didn't have all of these other issues. As you said, all issues are women's issues. There's no question about it. And I think this um, further kind of perpetuation of quote unquote women's issues being limited to those of women's health, obviously extremely important, has the unfortunate consequence of also um, excluding women who may be conservative on social issues or have different views on reproductive health and choice and how our laws should or should not reflect uh, those choices that women have to make, um, which, which is really unfortunate where um, I, I think in Congress some progress has been made where traditionally in the past, for example, um, you know, the Women's Caucus was often very focused solely on reproductive health issues. Uh, and was therefore very partisan. Uh, it's now been opened up in a very bipartisan way. There's bipartisan co-chairs to the Women's Caucus and they're dealing, yes, with women's health issues, but also a plethora of all the other issues that impact every one of us as individuals, our families, our country, our security. Uh, so, you know, I think there's slowly, slowly by slowly progress uh, being made in that department. And Aaron, if I may, I think that like when you decree something a women's issue, when you're at like at the root of that, it's 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 sort of it's making the statement that women don't actually belong in the sort of political sphere, right? That there's something that this is a small, insignificant amount of issues that can be their part, their like slice of this, like their small slice of this pie, because this is actually a man's world, right? Like that is like what we have to break from. And if you look at this is, you know, this is getting to a much bigger level, but the, the real, I think the real problem for women now is we continue to value men. I mean, every day, all, you know, all of us um, on this call are <laughs> shown uh, multiple times a day how men are valued more than we are, right? From the way from what our presidents look like to the music we hear on the radio um, to the, you know, 75% of Congress are still men to who makes the most money to the fact that women are only, only 7% of women in the, or are, are, are make up the fortune 500 C or women in the fortune 500 CEOs. Uh, there is not one black CEO in the fortune 500. Um, we just don't value women that as much as men. And, the if you look at what's happening economically to men uh, to women during the um during covid they are highest level of unemployment highest level of essential workers in the lowest paid professions and carrying all the burdens at home right we do not value women's work uh the way that we should it is obviously essential look at what just look at just what happened right from teachers to home health care workers and still we're operating under market systems that just do not value our effort the way men do. You know, I made an argument about how the women's soccer team, the U.S. women's soccer team, which, you know, keep, can't stop winning World Cup titles, no matter hard how they try, they can't stop winning. They have to sue to get paid what they're worth. And some guy was like responding to me on Twitter, well, that's because the market, you know, when, when women's sports can, you know, the way the market works, men, 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 men's sports bring in more revenue. I was like, yes, I get it. I get that we built the market to value men more than women. That's my point. That's like, we're getting, we're getting in it now, ladies, right? Like we are in it. Like this is what we have to upend now, the sense that our effort doesn't have as much as a value. The work that we do doesn't contribute as much to the society when we know we do. And then calling it women's issues is like a byproduct of that fundamental problem of not valuing women enough. Yeah. And yeah. 
If I, Aaron, I think this is a really great point to, to talk about what we value, right? So the value is also in our elected leaders because what we have valued in our elected leaders has aligned with the experiences and stereotypes associated with men, we've created a system again, where then it becomes harder for women to fit within that norm. And so the responsibility too often has been, you know, instead of saying to women, you need to change to fit the institution, it's how do you change the institution to fit women within it and to value women uh, within it. And I think we're getting there. We start to see women running in ways that say, look, my experience as a woman or my experience as a black woman is a value added to this office. I bring a perspective that is different. I bring experience that is different. And I'm not going to run away from that because you're going to call it identity politics. Because it's not just about my identity. It's about a perspective that's going to shape policy conversations. And I think if we stop sort of demonizing that conversation and actually value that perspective, we'll see more evaluation of it in terms of who we recruit and who we elect. Yeah. Well, we're working on it at the 19th, ladies. I promise. We're doing our, our level best. And, and uh, just to Jen's point, uh, you know, um, the pandemic has really kind of underscored the idea that all issues are women's issues because of the many ways that we are seeing women being both impacted by and responding to uh, coronavirus, an area of focus uh, that we have uh, hammered again and again, um, you know, during this uh, pandemic. So, um, you know, Kelly, I, I want to come back to you and ask you about, um, you know, what we don't understand about elect how electability works, what it will take for a, a woman to win, and really uh, the the the, um, the gender piece of that. How do men contribute to this myth, and how do women? contribute to this myth? And, and, and is this a conversation, for example, that changes when we talk about uh, like the intersectionality of race or sexual identity? Yeah, there's a lot there. And there's a lot we don't know. Um, but I think there is there are things we know that we sometimes ignore. So one is that women can be sexist. Um, women have gender biases. Um, and so they're also playing into the institutions as they are. And I'm sure the Congresswoman can attest to this in terms of her experiences and things that women have told her or suggested to her. Um, we know though that the other thing that certainly bugs me as somebody from the outside trying to see this change is that too often the expectation is that women will do all the work to change these institutions. So let's just get women in. They're going to change all the rules. They're going to change all the norms. They're going to make these institutions friendlier to women. But we know that men play a huge role, first of all, because they dominate all of these institutions still. Um, and their behaviors continue to shape the expectations of voters and citizens. So that's why no matter who Joe Biden chooses as a vice presidential nominee, as I mentioned before, is what we saw in how Donald Trump really plays in and doubles down on masculinity. And we're seeing that from candidates down ballot, especially right now on the GOP side, because that's what the messaging that seems to be working for them. Um, and so it's the imagery, it's the mass population, right? Like, so I'm going to say that this, this person doesn't look presidential, they're weak, they're tired, all of these things that perpetuate the idea that masculinity is the standard by which we should measure fitness for office. And so men can do better in the way that they campaign and in what they talk about as being important in campaigns and in office. Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely want to come, come back to that issue. Um, but Can I say something else about this, Aaron? Yeah. That I think that, that there's like a moment um, also for, um, because women hold all these biases in our heads to ride and women, um, and women, you know, I heard super sexist, got super sexist advice all the time from women about uh, what Hillary needed to do to change her voice or her hair or her presentation. Um, it's also that I think white women, you know, we're, have, we're having like a you know, collision of reckonings, reckonings around race, reckonings around gender, and that white women, as, um, you know, as, as much as the patriarchy can hold, hold all women back, um, it, it provides, it's provided refuge and a shelter for white women um, as well, right? And so we have a relatively somewhat comfortable, if wholly unsatisfying perch 
and we in, in in a man's world and a white man's world to um, be more specific and we don't want to give that up by supporting other women by supporting women of color by um, backing each other up and i think the big change that has to happen that will actually not just beyond just electing the first woman president but sort of removing stopping the stagnation the sort of stagnant muck that women are in right now kind of started 20 years ago we stopped making progress i think what's at the root of that is women not supporting each other or not and you know if you're a white woman not supporting uh people of color because the truth is um the power systems that block uh, women are the same power systems that block uh, all people of color from getting, uh, from you know, reaching the potential that they want as well. And so the realization I had was, um, you know, I thought I was doing great in the world. Um, I was like, I'm not doing great. I'm doing great propping this world up. I'm doing great making this white man's world run well for them and sustaining it, right? It's like, I work really hard and I don't argue enough to get paid what I'm worth because I don't want to be a problem. I'm just happy to be here. I just want to be part of the team. I think that if, you know, if I, if I stick my neck out to argue for myself or another woman or say, there's a really great black woman candidate and we should bring her in here because we need diversity because that's going to make our work better. I'm going to stand out and that's a problem. And that's exactly what you have to do right now, right? Because if you don't, we are never going to break out of this stagnation that we are in. Well, hi, you may notice that we have on different clothes. <laughs> Listen, there's an explanation for that. With Tuesday's pick of Kamala Harris as the Democratic vice presidential nominee, we felt that it was important to bring our panel back together uh, to discuss this historic moment and what it means uh, for the 2020 uh, election. So Kelly, I, I wanna start with you. Uh, what, do you what does it say that, that Joe Biden uh, has selected uh, Kamala Harris and, 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 and how, is, how do you see uh, that ticket uh, playing out uh, between now and November? So I think it's an important moment to sort of take in the history of the moment, right? To celebrate the fact that for the first time on a major party ticket, uh, we have a woman of color, more specifically, a woman who identifies as both black and South Asian. Um, this is important. Uh, this is progress, just simply in changing again, as we talked about before, the image of what we expect in the presidency. And I think that this starts to help us rethink the person who's at the top office as well. So I think there's a moment moment and a collective uh, breath that we take to say, let's celebrate that. Uh, and then let's dig in and let's figure out where this ticket is going to have its greatest strengths, some of the challenges that they're going to face. Of course, we're already seeing that. Um, but uh, I think it was a smart choice by him. Um, there had been good reason, particularly to choose a black woman. And in him doing that, uh, I think that there are a lot of folks that you're already seeing who are, are pretty happy that at least there's attention to that loyalty of black women voters to the party over time. And so there's a, a recognition of that in this choice. Jen, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would, you know, we all uh, thought it was going to be, it was most likely going to be Kamala Harris, but then when the moment actually comes, I wasn't quite prepared for how historic it really did feel. You know, it reminded me of when Barack Obama went, you know, Barack Obama was a talented sen senator from Illinois. We, people were paying attention to him. He was a rising star. And then at one point, once he become, became the Democratic nominee, you realized, oh, this is what it's been. He is the personification of progress. He is what we have been leading to, right? Hundreds of years of progress represented. It's been leading to Barack Obama. And then, you know, when I saw her um, and the speech that she gave with Biden, their first appearance together, you were like, wow, there she is, right? It is her. Kamala Harris is the one who, after hundreds of years of struggle, is going to be that person. And, you know, you, you could feel the support that she has from you know, everyone from, you know, women, all people of color, men, you know, every feeling that what the, the progress that's represented, it was a really smart choice for Biden, um, like a very mature leadership choice and, and, and understanding as, as somebody who worked with the first black president that his role was to to, to, to put forward a ticket that literally shows America how it can, how, how we can unite across, uh, you know, gender, race, age divides. 
Um, so all of that is remarkable. The Trump uh, reaction, I thought they were a little flat footed. Actually, I thought that they might have a more uh, precise argument to make against uh, Harris and the new Biden Harris ticket. And I think part of the reason why you know, they, they are struggling is because Kamala Harris is somebody, you know, she talks about how her mom says, do not let anyone tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. Right. So her whole life, and Erin, you know this way better than me, being a woman of color yourself, uh, you're having to, you're having to, you, uh, you're, you're having to, to uh, define for everyone yourself who you are and be very straightforward about it, right? So Donald Trump is too late. He is decades too late if he thinks that he's going to be able to define Kamala Harris in a way that is not true to her. Um, and then the final observation I have in the, you know, new in the first uh you know a few days of watching this is how important it is that women banded together to write that letter that they did to the uh to all of the news outlets to say we are watching you and if we see sexist coverage you know gendered coverage come into play we're going to call you out on it and i really think that that uh, that's had an impact already. I haven't seen questions about, well, is can Kamala Harris really be a good partner because she has all that frightful ambition? We haven't seen any of that yet. And it just really shows the power of, you know, when, when women band together to make change and, you know, as you all are doing in the 19th. They'll have tough days for sure. This ticket will, um, but, you know, it's, but, but a superb and really exciting uh, start for that ticket. Yeah, well, Jen, she certainly did uh, give a nod to uh, the heroic and ambitious women uh, who came before her. Uh, it, and it was momentous, uh, even though it didn't necessarily have kind of the huge stage that we're used to seeing when somebody debuts, you know, their running mate. But I think that that speaks to the moment that, that we all find ourselves in uh, with this global pandemic. Uh, you know, it had to be, uh, you know, socially distanced. Uh, you know, they came out in masks. Uh, that was very dramatic, but I think a reminder of, of the times that we are, that we are in uh, in the midst of this this election. Uh, Kelly, did you have anything to add about about the the vitriol that is already emerging, uh, you know, uh, around uh, this vice presidential nominee? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing we had talked about was the importance of Joe Biden himself being out there against this type of treatment, and you saw that already in his comments. Um, at their first event where he said, we need to have her back. That was a pretty not veiled uh, right um, pitch to say, we already know this is coming at her. Um, well, and I think Jen, Jen's point that, oh, sorry, go ahead. He, he said you could set your clock to it. And in fact, those were really kind of his first public comments denouncing uh, the tone and rhetoric uh, around any kind of gendered uh, attacks on, on uh, the vice presidential nominee. Uh, certainly we'd heard the campaign kind of push back against that during the beep stakes, but, uh, but, but him saying it today uh, as he was introducing her, I, I thought was something, I, it certainly I know a lot of the women uh, that I interview uh, had signaled that they wanted to hear. Yeah, and I think you're gonna have to continue to hear that. And also the fact that within the first line or two lines of her comments, she, she used that term, right? Her, the, the heroic and ambitious women before me. Um, that's lovely, right? Like that's what we, we want women to be in that space where they can call out the unfair and biased treatment that they're getting. And for so long in politics, women have been told like, well, don't do that because you're going to be accused of playing the gender card. You're going to be accused of playing the race card. Well, we're in the moment um, in this country where women are saying, I'm not going to listen to that and I'm going to stand up for myself. And I think Jen's point about Kamala Harris is not somebody who's going to back down from this. Um, and so I agree that the, the Trump sort of attack, the first attack is sort of nasty. It was pretty unoriginal um, because he, he uses it on everybody. Um, and so in that way, I think if there's any, you know, contest in these first couple of days, they really came out on top on that because these attacks are inconsistent and also um, just kind of the same old that we're used to um, that Donald Trump seems to put against any woman and particularly any woman of color who questions his power, right? Like, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to call you a name. And that's something Kamala Harris has seen from Jeff Sessions, Brett Kavanaugh, everybody who she's faced. And I love seeing the videos of her taking those men on and making them uncomfortable and making them question the, their white male privilege. Um, and uh, that's something that's, I think, energizing. It's certainly energizing women already on social media and elsewhere to say, yeah, this is the type of, of woman 
we're interested in supporting and backing. Yeah. Well, thank you both for your insights. I really appreciate it. We just want to note, because unfortunately we had to scramble to, to pull this conversation back together, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard was not able to rejoin our panel to give her thoughts on uh, the Vice Presidential Democratic uh, nominee. Uh, but I appreciate you, Kelly, and you, Jen, for coming back and, and weighing in on uh, this historic moment. Thank you both so much. What an extraordinary day. Thank you to everyone who is a part of it, including those of you watching along with us. If you liked what you saw today, we'd love it if you'd join us as founding members of the 19th. You can do that at 19thnews.org. The 19th is a member-supported newsroom, and we can't put on great free programming like this without your support. If you missed any part of this week's programming or you want to rewatch it, visit 19thnews.org forward slash events. We hope you'll join us tomorrow, the last day of the 19th represents, for some critically important conversations on race and gender featuring some leaders you absolutely won't want to miss. The lineup includes Senator Kamala Harris, poet, scholar, and president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, and authors Robin DiAngelo and Brittany Cooper in conversation with Sonny Hostin on race, gender, and allyship. We'll also have a special conversation on the 19th's mission to reach and reflect underserved women moderated by Megan, the Duchess of Sussex. A special thanks again to our generous sponsors and philanthropic partners. Goldman Sachs, Intuit, The Impact Seat, The Lenfest Institute, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The Wincote Foundation, The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, The Barbara Lee Family Foundation, The Stardust Fund, Pan America, The Heinz Endowments, CVS Health, The Panacea Collective, Aero PR, and Lingua Franca. We're so looking forward to tomorrow's conversations and we can't wait to see you back here.